Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath and happy Independence Day. I hope that you're having an awesome day wherever you are and that your walk with God is going well. And I definitely hope that, uh, you know, the message that we share today, I definitely think that'll be helpful uh, to anyone in their walk with God if you take these principles and you apply them to your heart and to your life. The subject that I want to talk to you about today is the subject of forgiveness. Now, when I was uh, new to the Christian faith, really was about 20 years ago when I was converted to Christ, I didn't have a whole lot of uh, really much knowledge of the Bible other than, you know, a little bit that I'd gotten here and there, going to church just a little bit while growing up, but not really a whole lot. We had one little spell where we went to church, you know, for, I don't remember, maybe less than a year. I just don't remember, but um, I, I learned a little bit there, but I'll be honest, I just didn't know much about the scriptures at all. But I had this really dramatic conversion experience where God just stepped in my life and, and revealed himself to me. And and I just really began seeking him. And of course, I, I knew enough to know if you want to you know, find God, then you should probably read the Bible. So I was reading the Bible and I started in Genesis and I uh, really just read all the way through from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through to the end of the book of Revelation. And of course, when you do something like that, which if you've never done it, I would highly encourage you to take that journey and really read through the whole Bible. There's a lot of interesting things in there. And there's things that will certainly challenge you and things that I found there that challenged me. And one of them is, uh, well, there's a lot of them, but one verse that I remember thinking, wow, that's, um, that's a pretty strong statement, is, uh, is found in Matthew chapter 6. Now, Matthew 6 is the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, Jesus gave this great sermon, and uh, it's recorded. Matthew recorded it, and he has a lot, of, a lot of great things to say, a lot of encouraging things to say, and he also has some challenging uh, things to say as well. And so I'll read for you Matthew chapter 6 and verse 14. This is what Jesus says. He says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now that's a pretty strong statement, right? Jesus is basically saying the same measure that you use to judge someone else is the same measure God will use toward you. If you forgive others of what they've done, against you, God will forgive you. But if you if you have a, a bitter heart toward other people and are unwilling to extend forgiveness, then that is evidence that the grace of Christ has not transformed the heart and therefore forgiveness of sins is, is really not there because there's not genuine repentance in the heart. Jesus also told a parable about this in Matthew chapter 18 about a guy who... Um, you know, who, who, you remember the story, right? The guy who, who basically owed so much money he could never pay it back and he pleaded for forgiveness from, uh, you know, his, uh, the one who, who, whom he owed the money to. And, and so he was forgiven and then he went and found someone that owed him just a little bit of money and he really shook him down really hard and was uh, very harsh with him and actually had him put in prison. And then people saw this and saw the hypocrisy in that and, uh, and went and told the guy that, that had just forgiven him all that debt. And so then that, that guy brought him back in and said, you know, look, I forgave you all this debt. You wouldn't forgive um, the guy that owed you something. So now I'm canceling my forgiveness to you. It's now, um, you now owe everything. And it was some exorbitant amount that the guy could not possibly pay. And so in reading through the Bible, not only in my conversion, my initial conversion, but also just throughout the years. I mean, the last two decades, I've spent a lot of time reading the Bible and I've found these kind of passages. And I've also worked a lot with people and I've also worked a lot with me and, and, and struggling with issues in my own heart. And I've seen other people struggle with issues. Um, and I've really asked myself, how does this really work you know, in real life? Because we live in a world that is full of sin and it's full of injustice and it's full of wrong things that can happen, and all of us have experienced some kind of injustice, and some of us more than others. As a pastor, I've had people share with me stories that are just terribly tragic, and some even horrific, of just how terrible uh, 
things have happened, some terrible things that have happened to people that others have done, have, per, have uh, perpetuated these, these crimes against people. And, and I just think to myself, that's just terrible. And, and sometimes when they were very vulnerable, like children, and, and so this can bring up very strong emotions um, and very hurtful feelings. And so God calls us to forgive, but sometimes the question is, how do we really do that? I remember once a pastor, I was actually, before I was a pastor, but I was having a discussion with a pastor um, just about spiritual things. And he said to me, he asked me a question. He said, Blake, do you know what the, lo the longest distance in the universe is? And I thought he was going to give me some kind of scientific answer, you know, like, um, like, like he had me you know, measured the universe or something. Like, well, what's the longest distance in the universe? And I said, no, I don't know. Well, what is the longest distance in the universe? He says, it's actually about 18 inches. And I said, 18 inches? How is that the longest distance in the universe? And he said, well, the longest distance in the universe is from the head to the heart. And I think that's about 18 inches there. Now, <clears throat> obviously, he's kind of making a joke about it. <clears throat> but there is a certain truth to that. You know, we can know something in our minds, but not really accept it in the heart or struggle with it in the heart. You know, I, I've, I've literally heard people say things like this to me. They'll say things like, um, you know, I'm not angry. I, I'm just mad that the person did this. <laughs> and I don't, you don't want to laugh, you know, but it's kind of ridiculous when someone says, I'm not angry when they're clearly are angry in the way they're, they're, they're communicating. And I, I'm thinking of a person actually that said this one time who said, I'm not angry. I'm just mad about such and such. And I just go, you know, being angry and being mad is kind of the same thing. And we can kind of laugh at that. We've all probably been that way before at times, you know, where we're just kind of in denial a little bit. But when someone says something like that, I think what this person was a Christian, I think what that person is really saying is, um, I don't think that I should feel this way. So I'm going to say that I'm not but really I'm having this, this emotional you know, response and there, there's, there's some denial going on with this. It's that 18 inch gap happening right there. And so with forgiveness, that's a very real thing. We can sometimes you know, say, okay, I choose to forgive this person, but yet there's still you know, feelings of bitterness. Now, we should make that choice. I wanna make that clear. We should choose with our minds what is right and not let our feelings and our emotions uh, run our lives. That's a recipe for a lot of trouble in life. We should fill our minds with the Word of God, know what His teachings are, and then choose to believe in what He says and choose to follow His commandments. And of course, one of them is to forgive others who have sinned against us. But just simply by uh, making that choice in the mind, there is still a lot of times a lag time of what goes on in the heart. And so I've wrestled with this on various issues in life, and I'm sure you have as well. I think all conscientious Christians who seek to live according to the scriptures will at times wrestle with this. And there's somebody in scripture that really comes to mind when you know, I think about the subject of forgiveness, and that's Joseph. You know, I know you're doing a series, uh, we're doing a series of, uh, about Joseph now. And, um, you know, it's, it's an amazing story, story of his life, right? But, um, so I won't have to you know, recap the whole story for that. I think you know who Joseph and, and his life story. But what I find amazing is that Joseph was treated so poorly by his brothers. And yet Joseph really did forgave his brother. He, he forgave them. Because Joseph was in a position where he could have retaliated against his brothers, and he did not do that. And in fact, it says when they were afraid of him, it, ha it happens more than once in, in, at the end there of Genesis. A couple of times, they're kind of afraid of Joseph, and they're saying, you know, please don't do anything bad. And, and he actually comforts them and, and tells them, no, it's okay, you know. But yet we see that he weeps so that the pain has not gone away. It isn't like Joseph saying, oh, guys, we were all a bunch of kids, you know. That's not his attitude. That was a terrible thing they did to him. It really had to tear his heart out to be betrayed like that by his own brothers. And it really ruined his life. I mean, his life with his, his, uh, you know, his family back at home, all that was gone forever. 
he was re he was done wrong. I mean, it was a terrible thing that happened there with Joseph. And so the pain of that betrayal and all of that that happened, that never fully left. I mean, because when it, when it came back up with his brothers, it says Joseph wept. But Joseph was able to forgive them. And I've done some meditating on this subject. And I think we'll just look at what Joseph has to uh, teach us about it because I think it's very instructive. So I'm going to be reading for you in Joseph, I mean, excuse me, in Genesis chapter 50, and I'll pick it up here in verse 15. So you know the story, Joseph's been reconciled with his brothers. They all come down to live there in Egypt. Joseph is this really prominent figure in, uh, in the nation of Egypt, very powerful. And, um, and their father, though, Jacob, has died. And so now the brothers are a little concerned that now that the father's out of the way, you know, maybe Joseph was being nice to us because he knew dad would be upset. But now that dad's gone, you know, maybe Joseph will do something to retaliate against us. They were obviously concerned about that. I want you to notice how Joseph reacts here. And Joseph's reaction and the things that he says to his brothers, I think it's really instructive and how Joseph was thinking about these issues. And that was the key to Joseph really finding freedom from this and not having this bitter and hostile um, attitude and feelings toward his brothers. All right, so Genesis 50, verse 15. It says, When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, <clears throat> they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us, and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And then it says, and Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? Now let that sink in for a minute. This is Joseph's reaction to them. And he tells them, Look, I'm not God. Don't be afraid. You know, there's a verse in the Bible, it's in the book of Romans. Romans 12 and verse 19, and it says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but give place to wrath. Or really what that's saying is, is um, give this to God. For vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And so this is a principle that Joseph understood many, many years before Paul ever wrote that in the book of Romans, that it is God who repays and who... Um, ultimately is the one who sets records straight and he does have vengeance on wickedness. And we'll talk about that in a minute because this sermon is really about justice and how um, that is a critical component for us to really understand and apply forgiveness in our lives. But I'll keep reading here. So Joseph said, do not be afraid for am I in the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. So he says, look, you meant it for evil, but God made all this work out for good. Joseph had seen the providence of God in all of this. Remember, he had those dreams, and then his brothers were bowing down to him. They got mad at him because of those dreams. And then all these years later, he saw how God orchestrated everything so that Joseph would be there um, saving many people because of the famine. His brothers came, bowed down to him. So Joseph knew that God had orchestrated all of this. And Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That's an important principle in forgiveness to know that even things that are meant for evil, God can turn those things around and really make our lives good and make things ultimately turn out for good. To me, one of the greatest examples in all of the Bible concerning this is the cross. That was a wicked and evil thing. That was clearly satanic. The, the devil was behind that. This angry mob murdered Jesus when he had done nothing wrong at all except heal people, bless people, and teach people the truth. 
That was the greatest injustice that has ever been done in the entire universe is to murder the Son of God. I can't think of anything more wicked than that. But yet, aren't we glad for the cross? Aren't we glad that Jesus died on the cross for our sins? Because Satan was trying to destroy Jesus, to kill him, and he literally did. But Jesus rose from the grave, and it is because of that sacrifice that humanity, you and me, we now have access to God through Christ and the forgiveness of sins. And so what the devil meant for evil and what that mob of people that were shouting crucify him and those Roman soldiers, what they meant for evil, God turned that around for good. Joseph saw that happening in his own life here. So he said to them, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. You know, I find that amazing that they were the ones that did Joseph wrong. And yet Joseph is the one comforting them. You know, I remember years ago, I have, you know, my children are, are 10, so I got, forgot for a second. You know, they change, it changes every year and you got two of them, so you have to kind of keep up with it. I have a 10 year old and a, and a six year old. Yeah, she just turned six. 10 year old and a six year old. And I remember my son's the 10 year old. And I remember when he was maybe three or so, I mean, pretty little, and we were in Home Depot. I still remember the store. And we were doing some fixer-up stuff on our house, and my wife and I and uh, our, our son were there in Home Depot. And he was that age where he really wanted to push the cart. You know, when kids are that age, when they just think they're really big, and he actually had to hold his hands up like over his head, you know, to reach the cart, and he wanted to push the cart, always wanted to push the cart. Well, the problem was he wasn't very good at steering the cart. And so we always had to kind of watch and tell him, well, hold on, because he would bump into things. Well, one day we were looking at um, whatever it was, whatever aisle we were on, I don't even remember. And he started pushing that cart and he pushed it on my wife's toe. And she was wearing like flip-flops, you know, and uh, and this, this cart, you know, and it was heavy. It had like stuff from Home Depot in it, you know. It wasn't like a grocery cart. It was one of those like Home Depot kind of carts, you know. You can really load up with things. And he just rammed that thing in her toe. And and it really hurt her, you know. I felt sorry for my wife. She really just, you could see the pain in her face, you know. And then my son felt really bad because he knew what he had done. He had pushed the cart into mommy's toe and he saw how bad it hurt mommy. And then he starts crying. He's all upset because he hurt mommy's toe. I'll never forget this. And then mommy had to kind of suck it up, you know, and just, oh, it's okay, honey, it's okay. And she picked him up and she was comforting him to make him feel better. <laughs> All the while her toe was the one that hurt, you know. And I remember seeing that and just thinking, wow, that is so much like Jesus, you know. We hurt him, but he comforts us. I mean, it's amazing. Before he's going to the cross, the night before he's going to the cross, he is actually comforting his disciples and telling them, you know, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I'm going to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may also be. So he's telling them, you know, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in me. I'm coming again. He's given them all these words of comfort. I would think that if I was going to die the next day, maybe my friend should comfort me instead of me being the comforter, right? But that's, that's who he is. That's his character. That's how Jesus is. And we can see that here in this story that Joseph is exhibiting those Christ-like traits, you know, of um, his brothers are obviously fearful. There's obviously guilt there. I mean, they did a terrible thing. And there's some cute, uh, clues in the story as you read through the story here. It's like about 13 chapters or so it covers all this. That you can see his brothers, I think, really do have guilt and really feel. This was something I think they probably repented of. That they realized that we really should not have done that. That that was a very ugly thing to do. That was um, obviously very hateful to Joseph. Very hurtful to their dad hurtful to their brother Benjamin, and ultimately probably hurtful to themselves. I think as they got older and realized, you know, that and what they had done, and also these were, these were 
Um, this was a, a God-fearing family. Now, they didn't always act like it, those brothers did, but ultimately they were worshipers of God and they believed in God and they knew what they had done was wrong. And that's a terrible feeling to have guilt, um, especially guilt that you really can't fix and make right. They couldn't just go down to Egypt and say, hey, Joseph, come on back home, buddy. They had really done something there was no going back from. I'm sure this was, was something that had weighed on their hearts for a long time. And then when they had this encounter with Joseph, you know, it's really, you're, you're just confronted with your sin. You know, there's your brother that you sinned against. And, and he's a big shot in Egypt. <laughs> you know? And then he actually saves all of you and helps you. I'm sure that kind of makes you feel, eh, yeah, I feel bad about that, what I did. And then when dad dies, they're fearful. They're fearful he's going to retaliate against them. And so they actually, they make all this stuff up. I don't think any of this happened. That Their dad, oh, I read dad, dad said don't do anything. I think dad knew Joseph and knew he wasn't going to do anything, but they were fearful. And they come to Joseph and, and Joseph actually comforts them. That's pretty amazing. How did Joseph get to that level of peace about this? and that level of forgiveness. And when I say peace about it, I don't mean the absence of emotion or the absence of pain. That's clearly not there because Joseph wept, you know, when his brothers approached him. Or actually when the, the messengers approached him, it says he wept, you know. And, and, uh, and we see in other places where Joseph wept when, when this issue comes up. So this is not something he took lightly. It was, it was a painful chapter in his life and one that when he remembered it, and when the issue came to the surface, it brought, you know, it brought emotion out of him, but it wasn't a bitter kind of emotion. And that's, that's the key. We will still have emotions when we think about the traumas that have happened to us in life, but through the power of God and his grace to give us forgiveness, um, we can experience um, those emotions without also having the sting of hatred, of bitterness, and of unforgiveness in our hearts. Because that will, as Jesus said, neutralize the work of the Spirit in our hearts. And so as you look at these passages here, I just want to share with you two main things that I get out of this. As I've wrestled with this in my own life and thought about, you know, how do I deal with situations where I've been wronged by people and then struggled with some, you know, negative thoughts and feelings of unforgiveness and all these principles have helped me, and I think they help Joseph, and I think they'll help anyone that applies them. So the first thing is, Joseph says, and this is in chapter 50 and verse 19 of Genesis, he says, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? You know, God promises that he will deal with sin. We often overlook the aspect of God's justice. We live in a society that is very, very permissive. And so we like stories of grace and mercy and, um, and forgiveness, and that's good. But we also have to remember that God is a just God. And I had a thought. This thought's going to sound a little radical at first, but just stay with me on it because I think you'll agree with it once you understand what I'm saying. You ready? It's a little radical. It's going to sound a little harsh at first. But here goes. God is going to kill every single wicked person that has ever lived, including you and including me. He's going to straight up kill me. Actually, God already has killed me because the old Blake died. I am not the person I used to be. I'm not perfect yet. I know that. But I can tell you plainly, when the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, that is me. I know what I was like before Jesus came into my life. I know the attitudes that I've had and the things that I did. And I know that I was changed by God. And I know that He is still changing me. And so the old Blake died. That person's really not there anymore. When I look back on my earlier life and think, think of some of the things I said and did and attitudes I had, it's embarrassing actually. I don't want people to know this. You know, I don't want people, I don't want people to know I did this stuff, you know, because I'm not that person anymore. That person's gone. That person died on the cross with Christ and the Holy Spirit birthed a new person. And so the guy I am today is not the guy that you would meet 20 years ago. That was a different person. 
So we either die that way, or if we refuse that heart transformation that God wants to give us, that being born again, as Jesus called it, if the Holy Spirit just knocks on the door of our hearts and keeps knocking and we just flat out, maybe we toy with the idea of following him, but we never really do it. We never really surrender our hearts to God and let him come in and make us a new heart. Well, then we're not born again. We're not, we're not changed. We're not really disciples. We may be Christians, maybe we go to church, but we're really not new the, the new creation you know that paul says and therefore when jesus comes again i'm sad to say it but those in that camp hear the words depart from me you worker of iniquity i never knew you and then those people will perish in the lake of fire in the last days and so this one simple concept really helped me understand the justice of god and how we can truly surrender every bad thing that's ever happened to us, every bitter feeling that we've ever had toward others. We can truly surrender this because we can say, wickedness will one day completely die in the universe. It will not exist anymore. And even the, the, the people that have done terrible things to us or terrible things we've done too, don't, don't forget, it's, not, it's, a, it's a two way street, right? You know, there's no one alive who can say, I've never done anything wrong or never done anyone else wrong. We all have. We've been done wrong. We've done others wrong. That's why Jesus says you need to forgive other people so God can forgive you. It's, it's definitely a two-way street. There's no one-way street when it comes to forgiveness, uh, you know, in God's kingdom. And so, you know, we're either going to perish, die, the old person dies, and a new person is birthed, or we're going to, if we refuse that, it's going to be in the lake of fire. Either way, the person who did that will not exist in heaven anymore. So we can truly understand that vengeance is God's. He will repay. You know, when I was a new Christian reading through the Bible, I read the story of David and, uh, and, uh, and Bathsheba. Remember that story when he basically committed adultery with another man's wife and then to cover it up and not get caught, he had that man killed. Uriah was her husband. And Uriah never knew about this that we know of doesn't say in scripture he ever knew and we don't think we ever did I don't think he did know you look how David kind of crafted it there was no way Uriah would have known that he set him up he set him up and had him killed and Uriah went to his grave probably thinking where's everybody going right because they abandoned you know they were fighting and and David had told the commander abandon Uriah in the battle and so they abandoned Uriah and Uriah was wondering where's his buddies are at and he got and he got killed well, I'll assume Uriah was a, was a God-fearing man. He certainly seems like that as we read about him in the Bible. So let's assume Uriah comes up in uh, the resurrection and he's there in heaven. And also David is, comes up in the resurrection and he's there in heaven. And let's assume Bathsheba comes up in the re resurrection and she's there in heaven. And Uriah doesn't know the story. He just remembers, wow, the last thing I remember is everybody took off. What happened? Well, you see, here's what, what happened, Uriah. It's a little awkward, you know, share this. You see what I'm saying? There can be some weird things, that, that some weird situations that sin can bring. And I remember reading this and thinking, okay, wait a minute. If David's going to heaven and Uriah's going to heaven, man, how's that going to work out? You know, Uriah's got to be mad. Like, hey, look, you know, that was wrong. And it was wrong. You see, but the David who did that, the man who did that is not going to be in heaven because David was changed. He was repentant over his sin. You can read about this in Psalm 51. And so whoever's done something bad to us or, or when we've done something bad to others, you know, God changes the heart and he changes us. We're not those people anymore. And we should hope that those who have sinned against us will experience genuine transformation and conversion and repentance because they will be new people and not be those who have done that to us. Because if they don't do that and they refuse that, then ultimately when God puts an end to sin, he, uh, he ends up putting an end to, to them as well. And that's obviously a tragic outcome, you know. So that's, uh, that's one dimension of, uh, of forgiveness that I found really, um, really helpful. 
And another one comes down to just accepting the providences of God. I'll read for you in verse 20. This is uh, also in, in Genesis chapter 50. Joseph says to his brothers, But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people. You know, Joseph waited and he saw the big picture. That was a terrible thing his brothers did. It really messed his life up. I'm sure when he was walking down to Egypt as a slave and thinking, I cannot believe that they have just done this. I'm sure he wasn't thinking, but praise the Lord, it's all gonna work out for good. No, I'm sure he was thinking this is terrible, that this is a, a, a terrible turn of events in his life. He sold into slavery. I'm sure when he was rotting away in a jail cell and with not really any hope other than God intervening and helping him for him to get out, I'm sure he was thinking, you know, things haven't turned out so good in my life, or at least was tempted to think that way. But I think Joseph kept the faith throughout his life, and he certainly got to see as his life progressed that where the devil had meant terrible things for Joseph, God had turned these things around for good and for a blessing to many people. Now notice, it doesn't mean that the pain went away from that. It doesn't mean that that, that was a good thing that happened to Joseph. It wasn't. But it means that God used it in a way to help many other people. I have known people that have suffered immensely. And I have also known people who have suffered immensely who have been able to turn that around and really minister to people in deeper ways than they could have if they had not gone through the things that they did. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, it's Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and it says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purposes. Sometimes we just have to cling to that promise in life and say, I cannot see how good is going to come out of you know, this situation. But if we just hold on to the Lord, trusting in Him and keep on obeying Him, because that's how we always demonstrate trust, is through obedience, you know, faith and works. So if we genuinely trust Him, we're going to walk in His ways. We won't give up on Him. We'll keep on walking with the Lord, trusting in Him. And then one day, often in this life or sometimes in the life that will come, we will look back and we will see how God was orchestrating all things for the good and benefit of His children. When we know that, when we know these two things, we know that God will punish all evil. He will destroy all wickedness, either in the heart of man or in the lake of fire. And we know that God will work all things out for the good of His people. I think this helps us bridge that 18-inch gap where we may be saying, I forgive, I forgive, but struggling in the heart. But as we really seek to apply these truths of forgiveness and mercy and love for others, even our enemies, Jesus says, we're to love them. If we truly understand the justice of God, the fairness of God, and how He's working in our lives, I think it really helps us to really be willing and able to really surrender all of this at the feet of Jesus and let Him take our burdens and carry them for us. For he certainly will do that. And he will give us in return. He will give us a heart of peace and a heart of love. Why don't we uh, close out with a word of prayer. Father, I just thank you so much for your incredible goodness. It's just amazing when we read in the scriptures how you work things out for your people and how you always have our best interest at heart, Father. Father, help each one of us to remember this no matter where we are in life, if we need to confess sin to others and ask them to forgive us, or if we need to forgive other people, maybe they've confessed and repented, maybe they haven't. But regardless, Father, we can surrender all of this to you, knowing that you are just, you are righteous, and you are merciful, and you are working out good in all things for your people. Father, thank you so much for this time we've had today to meditate on these things. May you impress these truths into our minds and into our hearts. For we ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen.